what the fuck is up no more parties here joining myself for a little day two nfl draft recap i know you guys are probably clawing to hear his opinions on Bijan and jameer gibbs and some of the other running backs that went off the board but day two is where the real juice and the real meat comes to play as it relates to fantasy and dynasty because we've got all these under the radar running backs and we've got uh, 162 pound wide receivers going in the second round and stuff so we need to start to decipher what's going on here um i did a full day one round one recap on the channel yesterday so you can go check that out but today uh we're gonna run through quickly round one because i do want to hear the opinions of jameer gibbs and this other stuff that happened in round one from noah and then we're gonna get into day two round two round three some of our favorite picks some of our least favorite picks any uh exciting landing spots etc we asked some questions from you guys on twitter so we'll probably dive into a little bit of q a at the end of the video mr noah i uh i love the sweatshirt i love the haircut i love everything i love everything about what's going on brother what's going on <laughs> i i appreciate it yeah uh what's going on is a haircut a sweatshirt and the nfl draft <laughs> so yeah we got we got a ton of wide receivers we got a ton of tight ends to talk about so yeah excited. all right well let's let's start off with um let's start off with round one we had my Atlanta Falcons diving into the running back pool because that was for sure our, our biggest need um, on our offense, on our entire team. <laughs> I've convinced myself that I like B. John Robinson as the pick. I've got, there's no other uh, avenue for me to go right now. You know, like I have to just buy all in on it and I have to be excited for him. He's a really good, really good kid. I watch a lot of interviews on him. You know, he was like all over the red carpet. So I'm excited that he's like joining the team from a character perspective. Also a very talented running back, of course, and our, our team is uh, – we got a lot of manpower on offense. I don't know what Desmond Ritter is going to be, but I'm starting to be excited about Bijan. This is a Falcons offensive line that's, like, wildly underrated as well, so he's going into a position where a, a dude like Tyler Algier can succeed. Uh, Bijan Robinson, I guess my only question for you is, like, is there any way he's not the 101 in dynasty drafts? And, like, how high are we drafting him now in, like, redraft leagues? I, I feel like top five is absolutely within the range of outcomes for him now. Yeah, I think in in this rookie class, he's he's definitely the one on one. Obviously, in single QB leagues, but in, in superflex, I think there's he's in he's in a tier with probably Richardson and Bryce Young for me. I probably would be taking Anthony Richardson over him just because I, I think the the rushing upside is going to be stupid. But it's Richardson then Bijan for me, and in redraft, like I I would I would not be shocked if he's the RB one overall in fantasy in year one like who else is there we got christian mccaffrey austin eckler survived day two that's of like the NFL that's draft. the conversation right there it's like c-mac probably the one the guy that you draft above him because we're excited about him being in san francisco and then the conversation starts immediately after that it's like Bijan eckler jt maybe like if Brees hall didn't get hurt possibly but like Bijan's right there yeah yeah for sure yeah tony pollard maybe is on the outside of that but like atlanta atlanta wants to run the ball a lot they they have Arthur Smith just pounds the rock. Uh, Bijan could see 300 carries in year one. We've seen uh, like creative usage from running backs out of Arthur Smith, like Cordero Patterson in the last couple of years, splitting him out wide and things like that. Bijan isn't a former wide receiver, but he can do some of the same stuff. So I think this is a spot that's nice for him from a volume standpoint and from a, like a usage standpoint, like I, the the concern for me pre-draft was that Bijan and Gibbs, these guys would land in spots where like these old like fuddy-duddy offensive coordinators would just like run them 25 times, or at least with Bijan, like run them 25 times and not throw the ball to him. I don't think that's necessarily the case with Arthur, with Arthur Smith, given that we've seen him use guys like like Cordero Patterson creatively. So I'm I'm really excited about this from from a fantasy standpoint. I think this is almost best case scenario for Bijan as far as landing spot goes. Yeah, I think it was like the nut landing spot as well for fantasy. I just don't – there's no world in which he's not just like a monster this year. And even even if the Falcons are bad, like I keep going back to Saquon's rookie year, right? He goes for 2,000 yards from scrimmage, 15 total touchdowns on a New York Giants team that was 5-11, and 11, you know? And a lot of that obviously came on the back mm -hmm. of 120 targets or whatever, but – Saquon, Bijan, a little bit different as players, but in terms of just like outlook for fantasy, they're in the same realm. And I think the upside is 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 crazy for Bijan. So I don't think there's much left to talk about there. But Jameer Gibbs was 
just a wild pick from Detroit at number 12. <laughs> and he lands in a backfield with DeAndre Swift, obviously. They signed David Montgomery. I feel like this all but says Swift has to be out of there. Day three makes a little bit of sense because that's probably what a team will have to give up. Swift's going to end up going to fucking Kansas City and just being a revelation out there uh, for the Chiefs. That would be super, super sexy. But Jameer Gibbs, like, I've, I've had my concerns with his size, but the way the – I think you could talk yourself into anything. I think you could talk yourself into liking any pick enough if you watch enough like executive boardroom celebration videos on Twitter and shit. Like the way <laughs> that they were celebrating, you would think that they grabbed Bijan in the second or third round, but they got Gibbs at 12. And now I think the biggest question comes like, how high, how high do we take Gibbs in rookie drafts? Is Gibbs clearly ahead of Jackson Smith and Jigba at that like 105? 106 range i know you haven't been like head over here is in love with jameer gibbs but now that he's a top 12 draft capital pick things have to change a little bit right for sure yeah i i have gibbs clearly above i mean clearly he's he's a tier above jsn for me in in rookie drafts right now uh i think deandre swift is not even like a consideration for me at this point like th this pick just tells me they are done with jameer or, or with deandre swift they mm -hmm. kind of felt like they were done with him anyway with the amount of work he was getting. Um, they signed David Montgomery. I think this is the, the, the fit on the ground is a little interesting to me. Like they're not a very zone heavy team, which is kind of what we would, we would prefer for Gibbs, but we, we've seen how they use Deandre Swift in the passing game. And, and Gibbs can kind of be like a one for one replacement for that and probably be even better. They picked him at 12. They were hyped about it. <laughs> like he's going to get tons of work. Jared Goff is going to be checking down to him over and over and over. Like th this is, th this is a pretty sick landing spot as well. And I think there's, I'm not necessarily predicting it, but I think there's a chance that David Montgomery is like close to being cooked. So Gibbs might, might turn out to be like the, the early down guy, or at least take a lot of that work earlier than we think as well. Yeah. I think with Gibbs, like I, I keep going back to Swift's role and we look back on it like negatively, but I think if you dropped Gibbs into what Swift did last year, he had 70 targets or something in 13 or 14 games. And we kind of romanticize this Lions offense right now, but they don't really have that many weapons, especially the first month and a half of the season because Jamison Williams is out for, for six games. TJ Hawkins is not there anymore. And it's like outside of Amon Ross St. Brown, I mean, Gibbs could end up being a six target per game guy like immediately. Right. And you don't really need a ton of rushing production. Uh, like it, That's just not that valuable. Right. To a guy like Gibbs and Gibbs is going to be used as a weapon. Now, I don't want to like overstate that because I think a lot of people like to talk about like, oh, this guy's going to be a weapon. He's going to run so many routes from the slot. And like typically running backs, they'll get like three to four snaps from the slot. Maybe maybe you'll get like one or two yeah. targets out of that when you're really looking at the numbers etc and then like every year we have like oh this guy is more than a running back he's a he's a weapon it's like yeah you said that with like james cook last year you said like everybody says it with everybody so i don't know i i just it, it's just one of those things where it's like all right had he gone at pick 48 or something like that to the lions it's a different discussion but pick 12 is just too serious of draft capital for you to like try to get cute and fade him here yeah for sure yeah they're they're gonna give him the ball and like my my kind of pre-draft hope for gibbs was he could get like Reggie Bush usage, like never really more than like 150 carries in a season early on, wasn't even efficient on the ground, and he was producing RB1 level seasons. And even in the same offense, DeAndre Swift wasn't playing very well and wasn't even getting that much work a lot of the time. And he was producing like low end RB1 numbers, high end RB2 numbers. Gibbs is going to do less dumb shit at the <laughs> line of scrimmage than DeAndre Swift was and like not get yanked off the field because of it. He doesn't have to be an awesome runner to be really nice in fantasy here. I, I, you know, like Ben Johnson is a is a good creative offensive coordinator. I, I think this is a really nice spot for Gibbs. Yeah. Also, uh, one more point on the on the coaching staff. Like Dan Campbell was also in New Orleans when they were using Alvin Kamara. So you'd have to think there's a little bit of inspiration there of like how they're going to yeah. use this guy. Obviously, the comps to Kamara there and. Uh, Reggie Bush had some great fucking years in Miami and then Detroit there and their similar style of player. So I could I could absolutely see um, uh, some some monster years coming from Gibbs, despite him being like kind of a, a enigma conundrum type of player in fantasy right now. I just don't you know, you, you, you don't pass up on that type of draft capital um, in dynasty rookie drafts. Now, where things get a little bit confusing is this wide receiver run, because now we have a mix of like 
cool landing spots, weird landing spots, opportunity. Maybe you like players. Maybe you don't like players. Midway through the first round, we had this wide receiver run where JSN went to Seattle. We had Quentin Johnson going to the Chargers. We have Zay Flowers going to Baltimore and Jordan Addison going to USC. And you know what? I'm going to throw Dalton Kincaid in there as the number five because he's a pass catcher and I think he's going to play pretty much like a wide receiver for um, for Buffalo. And I think like in rookie drafts, you're going to have to decide if you want Kincaid or you want Zay Flowers. Like it's going to be the 107 to 110 range where you're deciding between all these guys. So I won't ask you to break down all these dudes, but if you had to rank those five, let's just say, um, you know, like half PPR or whatever, give me give me those five ripped off. Yeah, right now I have I have JSN in a tier above them, like kind of right below Gibbs, right above uh, Quentin Johnston. Um, so I, J- JSN was my wide receiver one coming into the draft. I see no reason to move off of him there. I think the Seattle spot's really nice. He can t- t- play the slot like day one, like he was in his productive season at Ohio State. And then I've got Johnston, Addison, Flowers, and then Kincaid. Uh I don't understand why everybody hates this like Quentin Johnston pick. Like everybody is like clowning him as if he as if he sucks. I, I don't really get it. Like he's <laughs> he's athletic. He was productive. They needed a receiver. This is a good offense with a good quarterback. I like Quentin Johnson in LA. And then Jordan Addison, like he just fits perfectly next to Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson. He's gonna kill it in Minnesota. I think that's just such a nice fit. And then I have flowers over Kincaid right now just because wide receiver versus tight end i i lean yeah. wide receiver um but i don't have a i don't i don't have a strong opinion on flowers in baltimore it just seems like a kind of a weird spot like lamar jackson they're gonna run a lot it's kind of a weird mix of weapons there and then i don't really know what to do with with kincaid given how like buffalo's use tight ends like like dawson knox is a good player and not you know he hasn't been like uber productive and kincaid probably sh- we should expect him to be better than that but yeah, I just don't have a strong grasp on on either of those guys right now. Yeah, I have I have the same rankings pretty much, but I'll throw Kincaid over uh, Kincaid over Flowers. I'm I'm in love with Kincaid. I think he just moves different. I I really don't think uh, we're gonna look we're gonna look back and be like this dude is he's just a hybrid tight end. He's not necessary. He's not a Dawson Knox. Dawson Knox is just like a, the way I look at Knox is like he's a he's a decent football player that just happened to have like a really good combine. He's like best friends with Josh Allen. He got the contract or whatever, but Kincaid is really like a pass catcher when you watch him play Quentin Johnson. I'm all, I'm kind of all in on that too. I think Quentin Johnson's game oddly enough is like a mix of Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. I think you look at like the contract situation cause he's, he's like twitchy and good around the line of scrimmage like Allen, but he's also like a good downfield playmaker like Mike Williams. So I think he brings some good and some bad from both of their games. And I think, uh, sorry, I don't know. Are you hearing that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Just let let you know I'm popular <laughs> as fuck. I got people texting me all the time. Um, okay, so yeah, Quentin Johnson. I'm a I'm a big fan of the landing spot as well. And you look at the contract situation between both of those dudes, and there's a good chance one of them, like a lot of uh, a lot of smoke around Keenan Allen not being there come next year. So it's like one, maybe both are gone. Doubt that's going to happen. But like this feels like a you know let's get a really good playmaker for our quarterback as well as load up in case something changes in the near future. Big fan of Johnson, Addison. Yeah, feels like a little Devontae Smith, AJ Brown action kind of going on over there in Minnesota. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm kind of similar with the pass catchers. I would just probably throw Kincaid over Jordan Addison. Um, let's move to day two. All right, day two. So. Day two, Let, let's just start off with the 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 one running back. Seattle just – Seattle makes like a fucking a meme pick here basically, right? And they have Kenneth Walker who they took like 10 spots before Zach Charbonnet in last year's draft. Kenneth Walker was like a fucking revelation for them. He was amazing as a rookie. And now they draft Zach Charbonnet after drafting Jackson Smith and Jigba in round one. Uh, man, it's like really serious draft capital. Like 52nd overall – and it begs the question, I think a lot of people were excited for Charbonnet to land somewhere where maybe next year he could be like the three down guy. Maybe not right away, but Arizona where he could take the James Conner role or something like that. Now he goes yeah. to Seattle and it's like, uh, this kind of, I mean, it doesn't ruin Kenneth Walker, obviously, but it kind of caps his upside a little bit because they're definitely going to use Charbonnet in some sort of capacity. It's just like, do you have any sort of inkling on how this backfield splits up now? I no, I have no idea. I, I I think I would lean towards Walker being the one A and Charbonnet being the one B. 
but who fucking knows what Pete Carroll and those guys are going to do with this depth chart. Like it, it, cur- it could turn into just like a clear lead back situation, either direction. If they decide to like ride some sort of hot hand, it could be like, we're trading series. I, I have, I have no idea what they were thinking and I have no idea what they're thinking going forward. Like it, it just genuinely did not make sense. Uh, Cause I'm not the biggest Kenneth Walker fan. Like, I don't think he's that good of a receiver. Um, I, you know, had questions about his, his size and whether coaches were going to give him a workload going forward. I, I think he could handle a workload, but they're obviously not going to just let him be a bell cow now with Charbonnet there. And this, it sucks for both of them and, and sucks for like fantasy football. Cause we have no idea what's going to happen. Even like a month into the season, whatever's happening could change or somebody could get hurt and then lose a job. Like it, I don't, it's just a mess. Yeah, and I, it's just like you. I feel like they got to be psychotic to move away from Kenneth Walker as their workhorse at this point, just based on how good he was last year. And maybe this is more of a pick. It's just like, yeah, we're still focusing on the run game. And I think if you look back at uh, Pete Carroll's tenure in Seattle, it's like they they don't have Penny anymore, and they've had like this group of like six running backs over the last five six years that they continue to interchange in their backfield. And maybe they're just like, we want these two really good backs to kind of like siphon off of each other. I, I can't imagine a world where Walker's not the 1A, but you could definitely argue that Charbonnet is a much better pass catcher than Walker, and maybe he takes third down roll. Does that third down roll extend to the goal line? That's where things get messy, and it's like, what's Charbonnet's upside now? It's probably not a three-down workhorse, but he could still siphon. I, I guess the, the trouble is, like, where do you take him in rookie drafts now? I just redid my rankings this morning in terms of, like, overall for Superflex, and I think Charbonnet ended up – um see where i have him i got him down at 17 in super flex so he's like the 205 for me and it's like i can't take him in the first round because kenneth walker's there but also second round draft capital anything can happen we remember when chris carson beat out rashad penny when he was fucking seventh rounder compared to first rounder so it's like Pete carroll's a crazy person crazy things have happened crazier things have happened in fantasy football is that is that like the range you think you're looking at for charbonnet yeah i just i slapped together some quick quick rankings before we hopped on here and i had charbonnet at the 202. Okay. But I'm trying not to be a hater because I'm not the biggest Charbonnet guy either. So I, I think I put him there as like like trying to split the difference here. But yeah, I can yeah, see people, him in the middle uh, of this. People tell me you don't like anyone. A lot every, everyone's yeah, like, no, I, you like anybody. Except for except for Devon A. Chain and Zach Evans. I hate <laughs> all football players. But <laughs> uh, okay, so 202. Yeah, I, I think probably where we differ is I I took some of these like kind of underwhelming wide receivers that ended up in good landing spots and threw them above uh, Charbonnet. So we'll, we'll kind of jump into those wide receivers. We had way more wide receivers going the second round than we did in the, uh, th- than we did running backs. And the first one off the board was Jonathan Mingo going to Carolina. who was the eighth pick of the second round. We had um, actually, I'm going to put this up on the screen. We had, uh, you're, you're a Packers fan, right? Yeah. You're a Packers fan. Okay. So you guys came away with uh, a lot of offensive firepower. Uh, you probably wanted that O line in the first round, but you got um you got yeah. sniped there a little bit by Pittsburgh. But otherwise, I mean you came away with a lot of speed, you came away with a lot of uh semi fun players on offense at least. You have Marvin Mims rounding out the second round. We had Rashi Rice to Kansas City, Jaden Reed to Green Bay, we had uh Jonathan Mingo to Carolina. Anything in there get you Get you a little excited. Get you a little half chub over there. I kind of like these second round wide receivers, to be honest. Yeah, I the the one that I'm I'm kind of excited about is Mingo. He is. I mean, he's just got kind of a sexy profile. Uh, the to me, he's kind of like a hybrid between DK Metcalf and AJ Brown, like more of more of DK's game and like AJ Brown's body. But pairing him with Bryce Young in Carolina seems nice like there's not a lot else there what they have what adam thielen and like dj shark i think so i think yeah, jonathan mingo could could see you know decent decent like opportunity early on i have him as my my 12th ranked rookie right now maybe that's a little high um but he seems like a guy who could be productive early on so he's he's clearly above the rest of these guys for me and then i've got uh Jaden reed it's just a nice little landing spot in green bay they don't have anybody else i wasn't a huge fan of Jaden Reed, but I know he has like the, he checks the, you know, production and like early breakout boxes. So you kind of have to be semi in on him. And then these other dudes, 
like rice i just thought was so bad on film was not yeah, impressed so, at all i'm so glad that you said that because there's so many dudes like i actually feel like you and me kind of see film uh similarly at least for the wide receivers rashi rice and, and marvin mims are you a fan of mims no no okay thank you thank you i feel like i'm literally i actually feel like mugatu and zoolander and i'm like i feel like i'm fucking taking crazy pills because everybody just like will not shut the fuck up about marvin mims and i'm like man I don't see it with Mims. He runs like three routes. He did it in a Lincoln Riley offense. The most of his fucking touchdown, most of his production came via touchdowns. And it's like, I don't like when a huge percentage of production. I don't know, dude, I wasn't a fan. Um, I am, I'm rising a little bit on Rashi Rice only because uh, apparently most of the stuff that's coming out is like him and Mahomes work together a lot this off season. And then Mahomes mm. basically went to the front office and was like, go get this guy, which is why they traded up. But I also uh, am old enough to remember a time when Patrick Mahomes told the Chiefs to draft Clyde Edwards Hilaire with their first round pick. So I don't want to put too much stock into Mahomes as a player evaluator. I think Rashi Rice <laughs> is interesting because of the draft capital and because of what he uh, he does. I feel like he's just a very different wide receiver than the Chiefs have had over the last bunch of years. He's like a go up and get the ball on the sidelines, like great body control type of thing, which is the complete opposite of what they have in Sky Moore, Kadarius Tony, what they've tried to do in, in previous years. So I'm kind of interested in, in Rashi Rice. Um, I also do – I have Jonathan Mingo, I think, at number 11 right now. And these rankings are definitely subject okay. to change. But it's just like, how can you not? The It's like a blank canvas there for him and Bryce Young to pretty much mm -hmm. develop. I think he needs probably a little bit more work done in terms of, like, separation and tactician, whatever. But Adam Thielen's a good player to, like, be able to learn from. And I, I think uh, – I think it's uh, Mingo's a dude who played a lot of slot too, a big body slot, and like Adam Thielen did that for a long time in Minnesota. So I think that's uh, I think that's kind of interesting there. Yeah, and a, a good coaching staff there. Uh, yeah, I, Mingo Mingo has to be interesting, and and I get it with with Rishi Rice. He he's a big dude, contested catch guy, good after the catch. Mahomes, like if Mahomes is hand picking him, that I think that says something. <laughs> the dude's like LeBron yeah. James GMing his own team <laughs> there, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have Rice in the same tier as I have Mims and Jalen Hyatt would be like my next guy after them. Um, I think he's just better than Tank Dell because I think Tank Dell is like small and I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't think Cedric Tillman's very good. Josh Downs didn't wasn't drafted nearly as high as a lot of people thought he would be. Just a lot of like weird moving parts here. But yeah, Mingo clearly the best. Then Reed um, after that. I'm not taking these guys until like the late second round, I think. Yeah, that's that's probably where I'll have them slotted in. Um, just quickly on the tight ends, we had Sam Laporta go off as the tight end too. He's a dude I've been talking about for a while that I, I was really excited about. I did not expect him to get this type of draft capital or at least jump over Michael Mayer. But he goes to the Lions at 34, basically the replacement for TJ Hawkinson. I think they're similar players. I think Laporta is like a really good three-down player. He can catch the ball, good at contestant catches. I think you could say the same thing. And Laporta also tested out great, like very, very athletic um, under underrated tight end coming out of Iowa, fucking tight end you over there. And then you have Mayer one spot behind him going to the Raiders. And I think um, I wasn't blown away by Mayer, but I think you could just throw basically every buzzword possibly imaginable about Michael Mayer as a tight end. And they were like, oh, he does all this shit well, whatever. Those are a situation I think is pretty good, right? No more down Waller, no more Foster Moreau. Um, he kind of slots in there and could be a dude. I, with Michael Mayer, it's like, I look at Pat Fryermuth, right? And I'm like, Pat Fryermuth had a good rookie year, right? And then he becomes like a seventh, eighth round dynasty startup pick. And I feel like that's probably a decent projection for Michael Mayer, right? If he has a Pat Fryermuth level of rookie year, you're looking at him as a pretty early uh, dynasty startup pick. So I think there's a lot of value to be had there because he goes to a really good situation. And then your Green Bay Packers take the first of their two tight ends on day two. Luke Musgrave, crazy athletic player. I didn't love what I saw on film, but again, 42nd overall pick going to an offense with a lot of opportunity. Um, I won't put my player evaluation over everything. You have any uh, any strong takes on this like quick group of uh, athletic, you know, high level, high ceiling tight ends: Laporta, Mayer, Musgrave. Yeah, I have uh, Mayer right now near like uh, early mid second round, like above above Musgrave, above uh, Laporta. But I but I. Yeah, I don't have strong takes on these tight ends. Like, uh, you want to take shots on the athletic guys. Mayer's semi-athletic, I guess, um, but he's probably going to get opportunity there in in Oakland. Um, I don't know what to think about Musgrave. Like, he he wasn't a guy that I knew a ton about before the draft, but I like looked into him after the Packers took him. And like a lot of a lot of the film guys that I respect were 
all about Musgrave and he's super athletic, but like Scott Barrett had a tweet where he was like last or like super close to last and like every efficiency metric, like he drops a ton of passes, doesn't break Bro, any he's, tackles. He's Mike Kosicki, dude. He's really just Mike Kosicki. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, that's, that's kind of the way I look at him. It's like everyone who just sees him run and do things at the combine is just going to fall in love with him for no reason. He had very little production at Oregon state. I, I don't know for me, it's, it's not there, but again, like he's young, these guys can develop. You never really know. So with that kind of draft capital, I don't want to just like fade him completely, but he's definitely far behind Laporta mayor, um, uh, Kincaid in the first round. Like those three are clearly ahead of, uh, Musgrave for me, but I don't know. I, I guess, um, Musgrave, he'll be like an interesting case study on someone who's all these tight ends are so athletic that it's like you you don't yeah. want to count you don't want to count any of them out. Yeah, and that's like the one thing that we know kind of matters for tight ends. Like that's yeah, like production is hit or miss, but like all the productive guys in the NFL pretty much are have been like super athletes. And so yeah, Musgrave, Laporta, Kincaid, like you just take shots on them and, and see what happens. So we'll yeah, I don't know. But it's just <laughs> He Fuck might him. suck, but he might be, you know. Yeah, might he might. It's, there's just no predict. It's just there's no predicting fucking tight ends. There's no. I feel like yeah. we'll never find something that helps us actually know whether or not a player is going to be good. Uh, yeah. Let's let's talk about the QBs real quick because we have Will Levis go thirty third overall to the Titans. Probably going to be the guy after Ryan Tannehill there, and then Hendon Hooker around later goes to Detroit. I. I was like hesitant. I couldn't really figure out where I wanted to throw Levis in my Superflex rankings. And I'm like, man, this class is just so kind of weak after the first, you know, like seven, eight picks that it feels like Levis kind of, you got to start thinking about him there. I ended up putting him at 12. So he's like the back end of my first round. That's where I got him in my Superflex rankings. Clearly, obviously way behind the other quarterbacks, not even guaranteed, not even guaranteed to be like, the starter next year i almost feel like maybe if they don't move malik willis they could have a battle next year maybe malik willis like uh improves a little bit and then hooker down in the third round you kind of got to say the same thing it's like cool story and it was fun to see all the hype and stuff but now he's down there where matt corral was picked and Mal malik willis was picked and the hype just went ahead of where the actual player was and the storyline is easy to link up and say oh jared goff will be done in a year two years or whatever hooker will be the next guy but i mean third round capital is far from saying that explicitly so i don't know like where do you got levis in your rankings are you excited about taking him as like you know he's a value guy maybe maybe you feel really strongly that he'll be the starter next year and you're like i'm getting a fucking super flex starter at the 201 yeah i think there's very little chance that that levis is not a starting quarterback at some point in the next three years max but probably like this year or next year and yeah. you said you have him at 12 i have him at 11 so it sounds like we just flipped mingo and levis yeah um but yeah, in, in that same tier, like I, I don't, I'm not a quarterback evaluator and like everybody is so confident that Will Levis is just like terrible, but he was picked at the top of the second round. He was mocked frequently in the first round. Like we don't know anything about quarterbacks and he's, he's got a lot of the physical tools, crazier things have happened than like a guy like Will Levis turning into a, a decent NFL quarterback, but he doesn't even have to do that in order to be like a decent fantasy pick. He just has to start games at some point in the next two years exactly. and he'll have value in dynasty and you can either hold him and see what happens or you can flip him when that happens. So I think, I think you have to be interested in Levis as soon as like the, the flowers Kincaid Addison types are off the board. Uh, it's, it's, it's him and Mingo at the end of the first round for me. So I'm, I'm in on Levis, even though I, you know, it's very possible that he's not any good. And then yeah. I have Hooker in the middle of the second. I think kind of similar things about him. Mm -hmm. um, but like later draft capital, Goff is a little bit more established than Tannehill. So who knows there? Yeah, I got Hooker down at like 19. So you're talking about 207, 208 range. Um, we've seen this story kind of play itself out a few times with the middle round quarterbacks. It's it, With Will Levis, it is. it feels like, if you work under the assumption that he will be a starting quarterback at some point over the next two years, you're also kind of working under the assumption that you're probably buying him right now in rookie drafts at his floor, assuming you can get him somewhere from 112 to, you know, the 202. I'm, I'm very comfortable making that um, investment. I also think there's a chance that Levis is a dude who I wouldn't be surprised if he has, uh, if he gets a lot of playtime in the preseason. 
and he makes like a few big throws. You know, him and Traylon Burks connect on like one fifty yard pass, and it's like, oh, maybe we should have uh, considered Will Levis a little bit more seriously. <laughs> he's a dude I think with like a couple plays, given his athletic build and just like the way he sits as a QB. Uh, can shoot up draft boards really, really quickly. It's like he has that one play, and then you're sitting there for a year where he doesn't play, and you're like, mm, I remember last summer where he looked kind of good. So um, I'm, I'm like weirdly excited about Will Levis just because you get him at a value, and now you don't have to reach up at like the 105, 106 to take him. Let's move to um, the third round. We had a bunch of wide receivers. So we had, you know, um, miniature Tank Dell go to Houston. That's 69. Jalen Hyatt and Tillman, the Tennessee wide receivers i think the, the nfl it's crazy because the tennessee offense was so good this year statistically and, and productive wise but they're like this is just their way of saying with with those two guys head and hooker going to third rounds like we don't believe fucking for a second what you guys were doing out there in the uh, in tennessee yeah it's it, it was all fake it's, it's just a fake offense exactly it's just you're playing fucking monopoly games over here hyatt tillman go 73 74 to the giants and the browns josh downs to indy uh, at 79, and Michael Wilson, who I actually kind of love, goes to the Cardinals at 94. And then Trey Tucker, who just runs really, really fast in a straight line, goes to the Raiders. That's such a fucking Raiders pick. So actually not that many wide receivers here. Um, any standout to you amongst that group in terms of uh, dudes that you're actually excited about for fantasy? I'm, I'm a huge fan of Josh Downs. Yeah, I, I like Josh Downs. Um, I like him in Indy. Uh, they got what th- – they got Michael Pierce or no, what's Mike, Pierce. Michael Pittman Michael and Pittman. Alec Pierce, <laughs> um, like big, big dudes on the outside. And then mm-hmm. Downs can can play the slot. Uh, they just drafted Anthony Richardson. Like maybe they get good quarterback play. I like Downs. Um, he was nice on film. I also am kind of into Jalen Hyatt. Like I, I understand right. that he like broke out kind of late and was in a fake offense and isn't a great route runner and blah, blah, blah. But like dude has – a valuable skill set where he can like run fast as shit up the sideline or, you know, even over the middle downfield and like go up and get jump balls. Like he, he, he's strong through contact can make contested catches and they don't have a guy like that in New York. And I I don't know if that's going to result in like consistent fantasy numbers, but he's at least a, an explosive player with a valuable skill set in an offense that doesn't already have that. So I like Jalen Hyatt in New York with, again, a smart offensive coaching staff um, who can probably move him around in some of the same ways that they were at Tennessee, like get him moving in motion, um, get him in the slot, um, off the line of scrimmage. So I, I, I kind of like Jalen Hyatt, and I'm, I'm also into downs. I didn't really like Cedric Tillman. Uh, Tank Dell's really damn small. Um, yeah. None of those other guys are really that exciting to me. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm probably on the same page. You, I mean, the value for high is crazy considering how many times he was mocked in like the first round. I do actually think Hyatt and um, Hyatt and Darius Slayton don't have that dissimilar of a skill set because Slayton's kind of okay, like yeah. he he's more like a one trick pony uh, where like the only thing you really want to do with Slayton is throw the ball downfield and let him make a play in the air. I think Hyatt does basically everything better and brings more to the field. Uh, than Darius Slayton, so I don't know if they're like direct comps, but I do think they're an interesting um, interesting pair there, and the Giants badly needed fucking receiving weapons, so I think he can fit in and get a lot of opportunity right there. I'm a fan of Michael Wilson. Um, I don't know how much you've watched of him. He was like a later round dude that I was really excited about, and to see him get third round capital is cool. He's really, really, really smooth route runner. He's like one of the best dudes off the line of scrimmage, 6'2", 215 pounds. Goes to the Cardinals where like I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that offense is doing right now. Like DeAndre Hopkins probably going to be out of there sooner rather than later. Uh, Kyler, is he ever going to play? Who knows? I just think by the time next year rolls around, maybe they have a new quarterback and maybe this offense is like taking a new shape here. So I guess kind of hard to invest into somebody right now where you're like, okay, maybe they're a year away from maybe being a year away. But I do like Michael Wilson for all the people out there that like route runners. He's a dude to, um, he's a dude to check out. Let's, and a lot uh, of people don't a lot of people don't like Michael Wilson, which helps the people who do. Like he wasn't productive. He has yeah. this reputation as like a route runner who's just like a senior bowl guy who's not gonna do shit in the end. He's like a like a uh Riley Ridley or something like that. So like <laughs> you're probably not gonna have to pay up for him. And so there are other people who think he's like a poor man's Michael Thomas. So you you kind of get a shot on a guy like that for probably cheap. Like it's I don't know, it's a it's a low risk 
it's a low risk move being in on Michael Wilson. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I, I didn't think a lot of people were going to like him, but he is like the opposite of what analytical dudes like, you know? And I think yeah. he's one of those dudes where I like to put context behind it because he dealt with a lot of injuries and a lot of that stuff happened throughout his college career where it's, it's hard to put the numbers to what he did. And uh, for anyone that wants to watch tape, go watch. He went against Christian Gonzalez or his Oregon Stanford, right? Christian Gonzalez, first round cornerback, one of the smoothest players in all of college football. And he didn't come away with a bunch of statistics, but if you watch them one-on-one -on, -one on the line, Michael Wilson, I think he won at least like 50% of the routes against Christian Gonzalez. Like they had a great battle and he won a lot of routes, got open, created a lot of separation. Um, just didn't get the ball thrown to him always, but you know, that's, we're kind of like picking and choosing now. He just happens to be a dude that I like that ended up with third round capital. Let's talk about and, the and juicy he, shit here. No, no, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One more thing on Michael Wilson. He was like, to be fair to him, he was pretty productive as a sophomore on a terrible Stanford team. He had like almost 700 yards over 50 catches. Like he, he wasn't a guy who never did anything. He just, yeah, like you said, he dealt with injuries later on, but he, he was productive early on like we like to see with wide receivers. So it's not it's not crazy to think that he's a talented player who just kind of like had some rough injury luck. Yeah, and like that year where he led the Cardinals in receiving, um, like as a sophomore, you lead, you lead your team in receiving. They had Colby Parkinson. They had uh, Sammy Fajoko. So you have other actual like NFL players um, and they had Davis Mills throwing the ball. It was actually like low key, kind of a cool uh, Stanford offense that they had yeah. uh, going on over there. And I mean, you look at a dude like I don't think Jonathan Mingo ever led his team in receiving. So he's like a lot of a, a projection type player when you have some dudes out here that have actually produced and, you know, been the alpha on their team. So he's a dude you got uh, to look out for in the third, fourth rounds of your rookie drafts. I think. Um, some of these running backs are going to go a little bit earlier there. This is where things start to get juicy with the guys that we've been talking about for a few months now. You have Kendra Miller goes off as the RB4 in this class, 71st overall to the Saints. We had Tajay Spears go to the Titans at 81st overall. We had Tank Big or Devon H. Chang, 84th overall to Miami. That was hard over there. Tank Bigsby, 88th overall to the Jaguars. So you have four pretty big name in terms of like fantasy stuff. Uh, running backs go off in the third round. I don't know if any of them have like a clear path to being super fantasy relevant right now outside of probably Devon A-Chain. I feel like that mm -hmm. fit there in Miami is beautiful because they just want speed. And you look at Devon A-Chain, he's just basically like they re-signed Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson, which I thought were really good re-signings for them because they played very well for them last year. But you drop Devon A-Chain in there and he's basically like, a non-injured, way more explosive version of Raheem Mostert at this point. So, but I think this draft, I think they still have like Miles Gaskin on the roster too. So maybe that yeah. means there's something that Miles Gaskin does. I don't know if he's a special team or something, but to keep him on the roster for this long, maybe there's something that they like about him. I, I just think like the re-signing of those other two guys, I don't think it's a guarantee that both of them make the roster. Like if you draft Devon A-Chain, it's possible that it's like Devon A-Chain, Jeff Wilson, Miles Gaskin, like some kind of combination of that. Just imagine, imagine this. Imagine like we're in fucking July, and you hear, "Oh, Raheem Mostert gets let go from the Dolphins." Like, how fucking high does Devon A. Chain's ADP shoot up there? So, uh, Devon A. Chain, I mean, we're both really big fans of him as a runner. Now he lands in Miami, third round draft capital. Like, hard not to get excited about this. Yeah, I, I, I love it. This is the best fit. Like, maybe outside of Bijan, uh, at least like fantasy relevant players. This is, I think, the the most seamless fit in the draft so far, like a chain can run outside a little bit or, or can run inside a little bit, but he's an outside zone runner. And they, that's what they do in Miami. He's, you know, that, that's a Shanahan tree system. Mm -hmm. uh, Mostert is a really nice comp for a chain as a runner, I think. Um, and he's just like a clean decision maker. Who's going to get on the outside, like make the right decisions, plant and go. Like he, I, I, I love it. He's so damn fast. How Michael high you got him in your rankings, bro. I have him the first pick in the second round. Okay. Uh, so my RB, what is that, three in this class, which I don't think is is unreasonable at all. I, but, uh, yeah, I, I would not be surprised if A-Chain was a 1,000-yard rusher in year one. Whoa. I, 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 I don't know. I, I could see it. I think he's the best running back on that team. He's He's young. He can catch passes. Like, I, I don't know. It's it's a sick, sick fit there in Miami. Yeah, it, it is really exciting. I have him as my RB4 um, because I have I have Kendra Miller one spot above 
Devon A chain. Um, and I'm 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 kind of like going back and forth on this landing spot. Miller's like one of my favorite running backs in this class, you know, bar none. Really fun watch for me. He's he's just a very smooth player, and there's like not a lot that he does poorly. Um, not a big pass catcher, obviously. And you look at the Saints offense, and I think with Miller. I think what makes it such a tough projection is when these rookies end up in landing spots. I think our first our first mindset, our first thing that we think of is like either best case scenario or worst case scenario. And it's like for me, it's like Miller, cool, like Kamara's gonna get suspended eight games, Miller's gonna have a role. It's also like a decent chance that Miller just sits behind Kamara and Jamal Williams for like a full year and we're just like grasping straws, saying that we love the guy's talent for three years. Uh so I think like the best case scenario is trying to find a middle ground for what Miller will probably be. But they did bring in Jamal Williams, who I think Kendra Miller's like uh, – I, I actually kind of think he's like a similar uh, yeah, mix between Williams and Alvin Kamara, actually, in terms of skill set, which I don't know what that means in terms of like what his actual role is. Do you see him like actually getting onto the field year one outside of an Alvin Kamara suspension? maybe like it, it, it's easy to tell yourself the story of like, okay, Alvin Kamara came in as a rookie. They had Mark Ingram and Adrian Peterson that year and Kamara like forced his way onto the field just because he was so good. But Alvin Kamara had this like unique receiving skill set that Mark Ingram and Adrian Peterson did not have. Like there was a reason yeah. that like th- there was a role he could fill that they didn't already have there with those other guys. And yeah, Kendra Miller to me is like a more explosive, like younger version of Jamal Williams. Like he's a he's a tackle breaking machine. But I, outside of him just like supplanting Jamal Williams and becoming the early down runner there, I don't see how he gets on the field early on. Uh, like like it, it, if Alvin Kamara gets suspended, I think he'll be sprinkled in regardless, just because they're not going to feed. Uh, yeah. Jamal Williams 30 carries but it's kind of a tough backfield to project given that Miller is a similar archetype to a guy like Williams that they just brought in and makes sense in the context of like how they've used running backs in the past and Miller is a talented guy like he probably has value going forward I, I have him what at my uh, 17th ranked rookie right now I think uh, uh, just based on kind of first impressions but I, yeah, he he could tur- he he could supplant Jamal Williams and be fun in this offense. But he could also just sit behind both of these guys all season and give you nothing. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. by either of those outcomes. Yeah, I, I I wish like I wonder, you know, do do they sign if the draft happens before free agency, right? Like, do they sign Jamal Williams mm-hmm. if Kendra Miller is sitting there, or do they just assume that Kendra Miller, you know, takes that role? Because that that's like where I'm having so much trouble. I have him, I think, 15 right now. And I do think the more I think about it, I probably have to move him down a little bit. But I don't know. These depth charts are so flimsy, it feels like, in the NFL, especially when it doesn't feel like either of those dudes are, like, really cemented as big-time playmakers or have these off-the-field issues. So it's like one or two things can put Kendrick Miller, like, into the spotlight right away. But I need to, like, pull myself back a little bit because there's a really good chance that doesn't happen. Same thing with Tajay Spears down here Tennessee. Uh, I wasn't like overly in love with Tajay Spears when I watched him and when I looked at everything. Um, and he goes to Tennessee where Derrick Henry's obviously there, probably there for one more year, and then they're kind of stripping it down and rebuilding everything with Levis. Uh, I don't know. They drafted Hassan Haskins last year too, so even if Spears gets his um get, gets like a decent role, let's say next year, you got to think that the way they've ran Derrick Henry, even if Hassan Haskins stinks, like. They'll probably have some sort of early down, um, early down player. I don't know. Tajay Spears, yeah. the ACLs are are concerned. Like, you you have any any take on Tajay to Tennessee? It's like pretty fucking uninspiring. Yeah, I I think I'm a little bit more of a fan of Tajay Spears than you are, but I, I do view him as like a Michael Carter, Dion Lewis spectrum guy. Mm-hmm. They had Dion Lewis in Tennessee, what like five years ago to play next to Derrick Henry, and they ended up just. <laughs> basically fully going with Derrick Henry. And that, that was a while ago. Derrick Henry's older now, different coaching staff and things like that. But I I just need to see it before I can believe it with like any other running back in Tennessee being worth anything with yeah. Derrick Henry there. Like he, he needs to either break down or they need to just completely move on. And so for now, like I'm I'm tentatively in on Tajay Spears just because I like the talent, but it's 
tough to envision like them scaling back Derrick Henry's workload so much that Ty J Spears is relevant in year one. And then beyond that, I agree with you that like they're probably going to add a, a some other two down runner to, to like play alongside Ty J Spears. If he even turns out to yeah. be good, like it, it, it's a weird spot where I'm not sure he will ever actually be relevant, even though I, I kind of like him as a player. Yeah. He's fun. I just like, it feels like uh, if you're, if you're betting on Tajay Spears, if you're drafting him with capital, that's above wherever his ADP is, you're putting chips into a, into a hand that like is likely ROI negative here. Like if it hits, yeah, the upside could be cool, but it feels like there's a lot stacked against him. I'm all, in my mind, it's, he's a zero for year one question becomes like, does he become the guy in year two? And I think again, like looking at the archetype of this team, the way they've ran through Derrick Henry, I'd be really surprised if they don't try to grab a day two running back in next year's draft class. And you also have to like hope Will Levis is, you know, and I also don't want to go right to worst case scenario. Like, what if Will Levis is decent? What if he's like the QB 15 or 16 and can run a serviceable, serviceable offense? Then the the weapons in this offense are, you know, not terrible. And Todd J. Spears would obviously be part of that, like, rising tide. Um, but it just feels like it's an uphill battle to to really see relevance for, for Taj J. Spears within the first, like, two years. And if you're not getting, like, any sort of relevance from your rookie running back within the first, like, two, three years of their contract, it's almost like that's it's kind of a wasted pick. Yeah, and, and- I feel like with him specifically, he he almost needs a Derrick Henry injury this season in order to be the starter in year two. Because like it, if if Derrick Henry stays healthy all year, Tajay Spears probably isn't going to get to show out that much on the field to give the coaching staff confidence that he can be the guy. So if, if Henry is healthy all season, even if they move on from him next year, they're probably going to bring another guy in to pair with Spears because Spears will won't have had an opportunity to like show that he can play. Yeah. I, I think if you, if you just like look at their actions too, going back to, like you said, Dion Lewis, right. And they, they've tried to pair so many running backs with Derrick Henry. And at the end of the day, they just throw the clipboard out and say, hey, fuck it. Henry 30 touches a game. I mean, remember Darren, Darrington Evans, like I didn't yeah. like Darrington Evans, but he was a guy that like, you just kind of, you just like force a puzzle piece together. You go, Oh, small, very fast, explosive, perfect compliment he- to Derrick Henry. Ends up getting what, like fucking six touches his rookie year? He was a third round pick too. Yeah. And he exactly he had both of his ACLs, which Taj Spears does <laughs> not. Yeah. So it's like you look at that, Deion Lewis, Darrington Evans, like even Hassan Haskins could be like a breather back, barely touched the ball last year whatsoever. So I don't Ju- know. Betting Julius on... Chestnut. <laughs> the fucking goat, bro. <laughs> He'll always be part of our is he he's got a he's still on the Titans, right? Yeah, he's he's on the team still. Hell yeah, he'll he'll probably beat out fucking Tajay Spears too. So I yeah. I don't know. I don't I don't. I, it's hard to love the landing spot right away. I do think Tank Bigsby to Jacksonville kind of excites me a little bit. I don't mm-hmm. know why. I just feel like um, Tank, someone that I've I've risen on a little bit throughout the process. Didn't love him watching film. And I looked at the numbers. I was like, damn, he's kind of pretty fucking good. Let me take another look at this. And then he goes to Jacksonville, where I mean, your first assumption is like, oh, Travis Etienne workhorse. Doug Peterson's uh, Doug Peterson has been super clear about how he wants to operate that backfield, and I think they would have definitely been in a timeshare last year in some capacity if James Robinson uh, had two legs, if Snoop Connor wasn't Snoop Connor. So Tank feels like I, I th- I'd be surprised if he doesn't have a a pretty decent role pretty early on. Um, and I, I don't know, like, how are you feeling about Tank? I feel like this is a, a low key cool landing spot for him. No, I I definitely agree. He's I've like slowly like warmed up to tank Bigsby throughout this off season. Um, and am very open to the idea that like he was just in a dog shit situation and at Auburn and is actually as good as we saw that he was as a freshman. And if that's the case, like what's the big difference in talent level between ETN and Bigsby uh, Bigsby can catch passes as well. Um, he's a little bit of a dancer like ETN is. It, it, it's not as if ETN is like a flawless player. He he will like brain fart at the line of scrimmage and miss holes and drop passes and things like that. And he's got the explosiveness and, you know, the, the athletic talent to make up for those things and be an effective player. But there's a spot here for another talented running back to like take some work so ETN doesn't have to do everything because A, not a lot of teams want their running back to do everything. And B, ETN is a guy who probably shouldn't be doing everything so sprinkling Bigsby in here you know in and out of the lineup 
this could be like a 60 40 split where Bigsby is like a useful fantasy asset in, in some weeks, you know, late in the season where you're dealing with buys and things like that. You might want to throw Bigsby into your lineup on a, on a team that's kind of sexy on offense. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're definitely an ascending offense. So it's kind of just like one of those teams you want to get a piece of and hope that Trevor Lawrence, the magic kind of like sprinkles off on him. And yeah, there's definitely room for more carries, more touches for another running back there. Cause like you said, ETN is, Far from flawless. Has a lot of like cool upside traits, but they definitely want a secondary piece there. This could be a very cool backfield together. Who knows? Maybe Tank Bigsby gets in on the goal line for a decent portion of them. He's not like a smaller back by uh, by any means. So if we look at this this third round of running backs, we have again Kendry Miller, Tajay Spears, Tank Bigsby, and Devon A Chain. Um, if you're gonna go with like a quick rip off the top of the head rankings and rookie drafts how do you lay them out there uh a chain clearly the first there and then oh. i have miller spears then bigsby but i don't know while, while we've been talking here i kind of have talked myself into bigsby above miller and spears so i think mm-hmm. i'd probably flip that have them all in a similar tier uh, outside of a chain but a chain bigsby miller spears is i think the way i'd go all right. Yeah, I, th- I think I'm I'm kind of similar with there. Spears is going to be the last guy for me for sure, just based on everything that we talked about. But Bigsby and Bigsby and Kendrick Miller, I feel like either of those can kind of break either way. Wouldn't be surprised if like in two years we're looking back and like one, if not both of them, are you know top twenty four, top fifteen running backs, just because fantasy is weird and that's just the way um, the NFL plays out. Let's see anything else interesting. Your Packers took a second tight end, Tucker Craft at seventy, which is kind of weird after Luke Musgrave. Just give yeah. Jordan Love as many weapons as possible, I guess. Um, and then <sighs> Darnell Washington goes to Pittsburgh at ninety three. I was kind of excited to see where Darnell Washington lands, and I'm starting to wonder if people in fantasy, myself included, started to like fall too in love with the idea of Darnell Washington as opposed to like what he maybe brings to an NFL field immediately especially for fantasy and he goes to Pittsburgh and now you know behind Pat Pat Fryermuth and they have a lot of other weapons in this offense and it it kind of feels like he's probably left for dead as a fantasy player now yeah I agree I I love Darno Washington like his his tape he tested way more athletic than he looked on tape to Mm -hmm. me but he's just like a a fun player but yeah I'm not I'm not hoping for much fantasy uh anything from him in Pittsburgh what I do think he does is like he's going to help the offense as a whole. Like he's obviously oh, yeah. an excellent blocker. Like he's kind of a sixth offensive lineman out there can do some things in the passing game, but he's going to help Najee Harris. He's going to help Kenny Pickett. Um, he's he just kind of like raises the floor a little bit of that entire offense, but h- himself as a fantasy asset, I'm not super excited about. Yeah. It's, it's tough to get excited about there, but I, I mean the steel, I'm kind of excited about the Steelers offense as a whole. Now I feel like they, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of rebuilding without ever having to, like, tear it down. And now you, you bring in the first-round offensive lineman. You bring in Thornell Washington, who, like you said, basically a sixth offensive lineman, but also gives you another weapon uh, to work with, especially in, like, the goal line area, the red zone area. Kenny Pickett, I do expect to take uh, a little bit of, a, a, of a, a step up there. I think the Steelers' offense will probably be an underrated one from, um, from a fantasy perspective in 2020. Uh, 2023. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to see how that whole uh, division is actually kind of cool, right? Like the Ravens with Lamar and all these new weapons and Cincinnati's obviously fire the Browns. If Watson could get his shit together, this can go from like real quick shifted from, you know, five years ago, they were just like the, the most hard nosed defensive division. Every single game was like crazy and you're leaving with blood everywhere. And now it feels like it, it might be low key, like a shootout division. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if Kenny Pickett is competent, which I mean, he wasn't bad last year, and if he's like a, a competent quarterback, he's got weapons. Every other quarterback in that division is borderline MVP quality, at least some point in their career, you know, as far as, as Deshaun Watson goes, like could be, yeah, all of these offenses could be kind of nice. Yeah. It'll be a fun year. Um, so let's get some, some Twitter Q and a real quick. Well, that's just fucking unnecessary to be the first comment. <laughs> <laughs> is a rich one on one and super flex well Noah said it's a uh, definitely like a possibility i don't i don't think i would um 
it's not what I'm going to do personally. I would definitely just take Bijan. And, cause I, I do think like a lot of people are like, oh, if you have the one-on-one, you're really far away from a championship anyways. And it's like, Bijan's the type of player that turns your team around very quickly. If he's averaging 20 points per game, you probably just need a couple pieces around him. So I don't, I, I don't know if I'd take a QB over him, but I understand it because of the upside Richardson can have. Are you, do you have Richardson over Bryce Young? I do not actually. I have, I have uh, Bijan, Bryce, Anthony Richardson. Like those three are the tier okay. together, and then you know Strad will be the four there. Yeah. Um, are the second round rookie picks this year as bad as everyone says they are? Yeah, kinda. Um, I I I don't hate it. There's no clear like awesome players that I really want in the set. Like we're talking about Jonathan Mingo in the first, right? Like how excited were we <laughs> yeah. about Jonathan Mingo pre NFL draft, and now we got to use like the one eleven on him, like. If you look back in previous years, the 111 is where you got dudes like Justin Jefferson and T. Higgins. And, like, who am I to say that he's not the next of those guys? But, like, those guys were unbelievable prospects. And you were able to get them at that point in your rookie drafts. Yeah, I think there's opportunity for guys who go today, specifically running backs who go today. Some of these, like, Roshan Johnson, Izzy Abanacanda, Zach Evans-type guys. If they land in nice spots, like, those guys could could leapfrog some of these uninteresting default second round picks at this point um because there's go. nothing so have, uh, that question okay yeah going there you go right into that. yeah for sure I, I would do that um yeah i mean like listen if you don't like a i'm looking at like marvin mims right like you and me both don't like him he goes to denver if they don't move sutton or jerry judy i don't like the offense i don't know if i like the future of what they're doing over there i don't know if i want to invest in mims let's say uh, a, a good running back that you really like ends up in a great situation. You know, like that is somewhere where I'm probably trying to pull the trigger. Like rookie drafts are definitely where you want to be reloading on, um, on a lot of running backs. Yeah. If like, if Roshan Johnson landed in Tampa Bay or if Zach Evans landed in Dallas or, you know, these spots where there's room for a one B running back who could be kind of productive or score some touchdowns. Like I'm, I, yeah, I'm taking those guys over Mims over Hyatt over some of these, you know, Rishi Rice, maybe none of those guys are that exciting to me. So I would be willing to take a sexy day three running back over those guys. Yes, sir. I think it kicks off pretty soon. I think they start at noon today and then they run for like five, six hours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, all right, cool. Uh, well, we're almost at the hour mark, so we'll, We'll cut it here. Um, day two recap. I'll probably be back on the channel tomorrow. Talk about a day three recap. Um, I don't know, you know, how much uh, decent amount of fantasy relevant stuff, but you know, no one with enough draft capital would probably get too excited about maybe some cool landing spots today. Uh, but that'll wrap up today. Uh, go check out Noah's work over on nomoreparties.com. We will link that down below. He's got his rookie rankings, his dynasty running back rankings. He's got a bunch of free articles up there right now to go dive into some of your favorite prospects as they are. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you are new, uh, hit the thumbs up button down there while you're in the comment section, and we will see y'all tomorrow. So thank you, Noah.